that's where I do it. Good evening, everybody. Um, we have another episode of Lethal Sales tonight. This is episode number four um, with Larry Feldman and our special guest, Peter Smith, who brought smoke down from Canada. Take it away, guys. <laughs> I don't know about that smoking reference, uh, Peter. Uh, and by the way, for all concerned, uh, it is Peter Smith's birthday today. So happy birthday, Peter. We're gonna Thank sing. you very we're much, gonna, Larry. I appreciate it. Sing. Yeah, we're going to sing very soon, Peter. No, I hope you, no, I, no. I, singing I, I hope time. you have your earplugs handy. <laughs> and we, the only thing are... I want to hear is Larry in the nightclub. Here we go. We are we are uh, awaiting Brian Maxwell uh, coming a week off his honeymoon, who's tying up some loose business ends and should be with us shortly. Uh, also wanted to mention that we're uh, launching our site for automotive advisors, um, a team which features uh, John Ellis, uh, who knows as much about used cars and where to get them and what to do with them in electric vehicles as anybody on the planet. Uh, Brooke Furness, who if you're looking for compliance and holding people's feet to the fire, none better. And Duran Cage. Um, whose BDC training is is known throughout this industry. And of course, your humble guest host here, Larry Feldman, if you need uh, the best possible sales training or if you need any kind of sales or service personnel, we're excited um, and we're rolling forward with that. But back to lethal sales. Um, we got some nice feedback on the last couple shows uh, when we talked about the topic of ways to increase sales. And we didn't intend to do the show in, in different parts, but there's just so many ways to increase sales and so many people jumped in, including Peter, of course, and Rhonda had some good suggestions that uh, we're gonna go back to it and just throw some more ideas out, all of which will make people money. None of them that'll cost you any money. Uh, Peter, I got a bunch that I jotted down uh, coming from the dealership I'm working at in Bradenton. Did you have a good one to start with, or do you want me to jump in, my No, buddy? you jump on in. I'll just uh, I'll I'll ride along the wave and see if we can bring that uh, that into the beach. So let's sure. let's go for it. Well, in in the class I taught today, I, I went over one of uh, one of my easiest psychological ploys, and that's acting like the approximate four hundred it costs to have somebody walk into a dealership. Have the salespeople act like that money's coming out of their pocket rather than the dealers. Because no matter where you go or what you do, when you mystery shop, or sometimes if you're just a legitimate shopper, you get abused, you, you get disrespected, you don't get the full attention. And it's a, it's an absolute fact that if people had to put a cash deposit down before they talk to a customer, the customer's treatment would be exceptional. Because now, now the salesperson is bought in Rather than, well, it's the dealer's money, I'll get the next person that they pay to come into the business. So it's a simple one. It makes all the difference in the world. Um, and I just think it's foolproof. Act like it's your money, uh, which if you'll allow me, I'll dovetail it into, you know, take a look in the mirror and say, hey, how would I appreciate my behavior or lack thereof if I owned this dealership instead if I was just a salesperson? Because the mindset is everything, obviously. I mean, we can all sell the same cars. Um, the inventory is there. We can all use the computer. We can we can avail ourselves of the advertising. So why are some people mega successful and some people every month are scraping by? It's the mindset. You know, it's the same concept, Peter, of, of, of when people get out of the car and I was a salesperson, I thought everybody I saw I was going to sell. I, I got almost 20 people and I'm going to have about another six or seven tomorrow at the, I'm working at a Toyota and a Kia dealership in Bradenton, Florida, Gettle. Uh, I'm looking at these people. I know I'm getting them hired. I got them pumped up. I got the managers excited. If they said, how are you doing? I said, yeah, you know how it is. A bunch of no good people. They, they would think they got no good people. Mindset is everything. And in a time like now, when the, when the ground is shifting under our feet and inventory and all the different, you know, things, chat, GPT, the whole bit. Now more than ever, it's important to be a human being with a positive attitude. Do you agree, uh, my friend? 100%, uh, uh, Larry. I'm, I'm going to give you two quick stories from my my days in, 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 in this business, which date back to 1982. First one that, that in, in you, you mentioned the Toyota store. So oh, 1982? 82. Yeah, we just determined that A, it 
it, it's Peter's birthday, and B, his social security number is 11. <laughs> <laughs> so if we go back to the two two stories I can remember without a shadow of a doubt, one, one was this little old lady, the proverbial old lady, comes into my Toyota dealership I'm working at as a young man. And she walks in and, and she she's she's doing a stutter step because she's she's older than dust. OK, she is she is the the oldest customer I've ever seen in my entire life. She walks in and she goes, no one's looking after I, I'm, I'm the young guy. So I walk up and I go, hi, can I can I be of any help to you today? And, and she says, yes, my name is Lena Mae Campbell. It's my 92nd birthday. I just passed my driver's license because after 80 in, in Ontario, you have to get retested every year. She goes, I just passed my driver's license and I'm going to reward myself with a new car. And I said, oh, that's nice. She goes, I want your cheapest car with automatic transmission and air conditioning. Not that I can't buy the best one because I can. I want your cheapest one. I said, okay, no problem. So I showed her a Toyota Tercel, four-door with air, and said, great, buy it. Here, here, how much is it? It's this, okay. Here's a check, boom, nothing. All done. Wrapped up in 10 minutes. And I made more on that Tercel than I made on the average camera sale at the time. Because there was no argument. It was just, there's the price, there's it, the, done. She took the is it fair to is it fair to preclude that if you prejudged her and thought she was too old, she was too this, she was too yep. that, somebody oh, yeah. else somebody else maybe would have got the sale or maybe not if they were insensitive to her needs. Well, Larry, it gets even better. She traded in, this was in 1992. She traded in a 1974 AMC Matador. Okay. The Matador had 800 miles on it. Oh my God. <laughs> she used the car only to go to get groceries. That was it. Literally, literally Peter, Peter, I got to be damn near as old as you because I actually remember the commercial where the people would say, so that's a matador. <laughs> <laughs> so going, going forward with this, two years later, she's going through the light from her, her, from her apartment building to the grocery store across the street and a young kid goes through the red light and 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 takes off the front end of her herself she's 94 years old she called her husband calls me up he's 96 and says lena may was just in an accident i'm going oh, oh my god what's going on anyways long story short she said i'm i'm fine i want my new car she ordered she got a brand new car and kept on driving and she was 94 at that time. Just what blood. Peter isn't telling you is he's the guy that ran into her car. He's in yeah, right. <laughs> Hey, you got to go after that repeat business, right? Yeah, right. So, I think that is a great story. But, That's but a fabulous the, story. The whole thing there was I never prejudged her. I never looked at her and went, oh, my God, who's going to – why am I wasting my time with someone that, that can barely walk and, and is old enough to be my grandmother's grandmother? um the it i just didn't do it and it it happened I, I worked in a place in toronto that had a very high net worth demographic and at that toyota dealership i sold three of the top 10 wealthiest families in canada cars toyota. three of the top 10. By, by the way before you tell your second story um, I'm going to shock you when I say it's okay for me if you prejudge every customer, just as long as the judgment you make is they're a buyer. Absolutely. As long as Everyone's a buyer. That's your concept. Everybody you see getting out of the car is coming to buy a car from you and you're delighted to see them and you're excited. I'm fine with that. It's when these morons start okay. so, deciding why you're not a buyer. Your car is too old. It's too new. You came in on a bicycle. Your, your clothes are dirty. Go ahead. What's your second story, Peter? So second story is last night I'm walking around and I'm walking with my dog and, and I'm on the phone with a, a young man that I've been mentoring for the last four years. And said, so, what's so, your dog's name, Peter? Chester. Chester, the golden retriever. Oh. And 
So I'm walking Chester and, and talking to this guy by the name of Lue Yaziggy. And he uh, he now works for Lexus. And I said to him, we're talking about his closing, his his deal hopper, his his funnel, his this, is that, everything. And I said, the, the very, very worst thing that you have is the fear of price. And it was... He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you're scared of price. As soon as someone says, oh, I can get a price better somewhere else, you start you start fumbling, you start freezing, you start, you have no idea on how to deal with it. And I said, you're selling like Lexus. You're selling a premium brand. And, and you're telling me that the average person beats you up or you lose a deal for $1,000. And I said, if you finance that over six years, that's seventeen dollars a month. That's fifty cents a day. You trying to tell me that you're losing over fifty cents a day? And he said, "Yeah." I said, "Well, then, then you're looking at it the approach the wrong way." And it goes back to my second story. My second story was I was working in this Toyota dealership. This guy walks in with a broken arm. And he's got this young young girl with him, and he says, I, my daughter wants to look at a forerunner. I said, okay, sure, no problem. And so we start talking about the car, and we, drive, and we go out for a test drive and that, and he goes, do you mind dropping me off at home? I, my arm's sore, and I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So it was on our way on our test drive route. So I dropped him off at home. He lived in about a 20,000-square-foot house, and out front of his house, he had a Ferrari Testarossa, a Lamborghini Couch Dash, and a, and a Link. A limo that was the longest limo I've ever seen in my entire life and he had three beautiful girls washing the cars on a summer day I was like man well this guy happened to be one of the wealthiest guys in Canada and long story short he owned a car he owned multiple car dealerships and he had gotten out of the car business and he wanted to buy his daughter a forerunner so when we started talking and we started negotiating, he goes, I called the guy I sold my dealership to to get me the car and see what, what your margin was. And he told me, and he came back to me and he said, you're making a healthy margin on this. And I said, yes, we are. We're entitled to make a margin. It's not it's not a dirty word. He goes, you're, you're absolutely right. Margins allow you to look after your customer. Will you look after my daughter? And I said, I would look after your daughter like she's my sister. And he says, fine, I'll pay you what you want. Never negotiated, not one thing. And what it comes down to is attitude and servitude. Servitude is what you need in this business. You have to service someone so good that they do not want to go anywhere else. They do not care about money anymore. I talk about this term about the hamburger deal. And people go, what's that? I said, what's the cheapest hamburger you've ever had? And I can tell you right now, it's a dollar. Everyone says a dollar. I said, what's the most expensive one? And I get anywhere from 18 to 25 to 30 to 45 dollars if you go to Vegas. And I said, what's the di what's the difference between the two? They both satisfy your hunger. A car gets you from point A to point B. Doesn't matter what kind of car it is, still gets you from point A to point B. So if you know that you can get something cheap and get there from point A to point B, and you're only paying this amount of money, why are you spending the rest? It's the same thing as a hamburger. It's not about price. It's about what you want, the value you perceived, and the service you're getting. End of story. I have two problems with your story. First, I, I've been training and running around like a nut all day and haven't eaten. So the hamburger <laughs> just made me hungry. And second of all, the mistake you made with, with the guy with the broken arm was when he said, w w are you planning to take care of my daughter? You should have said, till death do we part. I'm proposing <laughs> to her as soon as I get back in the car. Because trust me, that's what I would have done. My <laughs> wife would have got over it. She's very understanding. <laughs> yeah, I was a I was a, a young, immature guy at that point. I didn't know I didn't know the selling skills that I needed to have. But funny you say that. I was number 122nd in Canada at 19 years old at a 3,500 Toyota salespeople. Well, that's because you're a sincere guy. Um, people can always tell a phony. Even if they're not smart, they can smell a phony. Oh. And you don't have a phony bone in your body. And that's what radiates through. Um, it's authenticity. 
it's it's right there if if you go into every opportunity that you are working for that person you and you actually are because that person is paying your paycheck peter i tell i i've told the story before ronda loves it because it shows that i am my usual mentally unstable self i went to uh, south carolina many years ago realized I was the only Jewish person for a long distance because every single person wore a cross. The dogs were wearing crosses. And I figured I'd have some fun. And I opened up to a crowded, crowded room of people and the guy that hired me and said, I got to tell you, Jesus Christ would have been the greatest used car manager all time. And the guy that hired me started to have a stroke. It's like, oh my God, who did I hire? I held up my hands and says, don't get upset. Think about it. He invented servant management. He washed the feet of the disciples. Imagine if managers had nurtured their salespeople, they would nurture the customers. Because if you came up in 82 and I came up a couple years after you, we went through beatings that were oh. incredible. We'd go into a sales meeting, we'd hear language that would make a sailor blush, got beaten into a, into a protoplasm. And then when you're laying there in a puddle, okay, go out and sell cars. Larry, it's my my general manager set, started off every Saturday me meeting with the same saying, beatings will continue until from morale improves. Right. Right, right. right from the bridge of the River Kwai. Right. Uh, and uh, I, I, I remembered that saying for 40 years because it, it was the way it was. It was, and I, I commented on LinkedIn last night to a gentleman by the name of Michael Curry from Steel, um steel hyundai genesis and halifax where the fires are by the way um the <laughs> he 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 had his top salesperson for the month did 55 units in last month all along mentoring a new salesperson and got the new salesperson back to back months of 20 plus and it was it wasn't about the salesperson getting to 55 it was about him bringing a mentor in that he's done back to back 20 month you or cardinal months absolutely servant leadership it's all about health and i never i never understood peter when somebody did something good and somebody themselves was so insecure so short sighted that instead of saying, man, you're my champ, they would get about time you did something right. Shakespeare right. called it damning with faint praise. Right. Um, it never costs you much to have a kind word or give a note of encouragement. And I think what we forget is unless you're a deviant killer, unless you're Elon Musk or Albert Einstein, we're mostly the same. Yeah. And that means that we, we have incredible insecurities. I, I love to tell the story that I'm a musician, as you know, and you could you could argue that the most successful musician in history is Paul McCartney. Yep. He had a tremendous amount of hits without the Beatles. He obviously, I mean, his catalog with the Beatles is beyond human comprehension. If he did nothing yep. but Hey Jude or Lady Madonna or Let It Be, so on and so forth. And when they signed their deal way, way back, early 60s, the agreement was they signed with a guy named Dick James, who also had Elton John, that the songs would read Lennon and McCartney. Didn't matter if Lennon wrote it. Didn't matter if McCartney wrote it alone. It would always say Lennon and McCartney. And obviously, they're the biggest band in history. Uh, my favorite band, the Rolling Stones, would have never been heard of because nobody broke in America. We used to send, you know, Elvis and, well, Elvis never physically went there, but Buddy Holly and Chuck Berry and the, the great bluesmen there. And we laughed at British acts. So- yep. The guy isn't successful, and he's even beyond mega successful. So he put out a live album quite a while back, and he thought, you know what? I'm doing songs that I wrote, like yesterday. That's his song. But Lennon had nothing to do with it. So for that album, the, the Beatles songs he did that were his songs, he flipped to McCartney-Lennon rather than Lennon-McCartney. Now, Yoko Ono sued him, and immediately they had to stop the pressing, and they, they switched it back. But... You wonder, that's your concern? You're a billionaire. He's, he's the only musician on earth wealthier than Andrew Lloyd Webber. He can still fill out any stadium in the world. The old records he made were amazing. The mid-level records he made, you know, Band on the Run and Maybe I'm Amazed are 
astonishing. He's Paul McCartney. I think if I was Paul McCartney, I, I'm Larry Feldman, and I'm not worried about nonsense in a band. That's why I've kept my band together so long. So the key to remember is everybody's going through something. Everybody's a little insecure. Everybody needs a hug, and everybody likes to hear thank you and 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 be encouraged. And the fact that it's it's in so many industries, but so prevalent in ours shows the short-sightedness of our business. Our business model has been so strong for so long that you can do everything wrong and still make a fortune Yep. because people don't want to walk. But it just boggles my mind, uh, my philosophy, and I don't mean this to sound cold. I mean it the other way around. I was nice to everybody until I had a fire and they left because I, I, I observed people really brutalizing somebody. The word this cursing them out. All right, I'll give you another chance. Well, you, you shouldn't have bothered because they're so demoralized that instead of walking around trying to work, they're angry. It's it's why cheating people, beating them up for a couple bucks, you should just fire them because you think now they're still on your team. And as soon as they walk out of your office, they're already trying to figure out the exit path. So once we understand that we're the same, we're not different in, for most, in most regards, and that everybody likes to get a great job, like nice, you know, nice to see you. I walked into this dealership. I mean, I felt like I was home. The guy that I begged him, this is a great story. I'm not making it up. Uh, there was a guy in class. I was last here two years ago. I got seven people hired. They're all there. They're all rocking. But there was one guy they did not want to hire. They didn't want to hire him. I says, you're hiring this damn guy or I'm not coming back. Not that they're afraid of me, but okay, we'll take a shot. Feldman's really giving us a hard time. The guy became a superstar. He's now their finance manager, and he's knocking the ball out of the park. Right. So he hugged me. The managers were saying, man, Larry gets, it just felt great. It doesn't cost you anything to say thank you, to say great job, to say you're an ace. But it right. costs you a fortune to make people feel unappreciated. It's, it's another reason why our business is so transitory and why the attrition rate is so great, which, by the way, I'm all for the attrition rate being absolutely horrible. Uh, it looks like my man Duran Cage is joining. Duran, how are you, sir? You're muted, Duran. Better you than no time. You know what I mean? I apologize. I had a call that got long-winded. Good to see you all. Hey, Larry. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey Duran, let me let me tell you who you're who you're looking at and who you're talking to. Uh, Peter Smith is an ex-hockey player, a brilliant car guy. And he went, it, it's his birthday today. So a couple of days ago, he and his wife went out and did some marshmallow fire in the woods and the whole woods caught fire. You might've seen it on the news. He's about to be locked up. This might be a swan song. <laughs> Rhonda is my publicist. Uh, and here comes John Ellis. Uh, you guys missed a fabulous introduction. I talked kindly about John, Duran and Brooke, um, but we're thrilled you're here. Gentlemen, I'm gonna call on your expertise uh, we're talking about ways you can increase sales. Uh, Duran and John, I already hit them with act like the approximate $400 it costs to bring a customer in is coming out of your pocket. Because I know you and John will agree. If you had to put a $400 cash deposit down, you wouldn't blow somebody off or, or under qualify them or do anything. Uh, Peter told a story about a 92 year old woman. Everybody ran away. He was the rookie. He sold her. He made a ton of dough. Her car got smashed up. She bought another one. So Duran and Peter, Duran is one of the best, if not the best BDC trainers ever. Okay. Um, and John Ellis knows more about used cars and how to get them and how to function them uh, and electric vehicles than anybody on the planet Earth. So John and Duran, that was a hell of a buildup. You better say something smart. Give me a good idea, John or Duran, to increase sales. There's no question that sales are, you know, the, the dealership is a, is an organism. And this is how I like to explain it. The operations is the heartbeat and the inventory volume is the blood. And what we have to do is we have to get excitement and energy by training our people in a way that makes them feel optimistic that they're in a good place. They're in a good leadership. They're in a good organization. They have fresh, good inventory to sell. And then we have to go out there and be aggressive in the market to sell it. The way we oh, hey, John, hold on for a second. Peter, do you see why I'm so excited to be with John Ellis? Before he got on, I told three dirty jokes and made fun of you and Rhonda. He just turned this into a medical exam show. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
that's that's where the, you get the professionalism. <laughs> uh, whoa, 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 whoa. It ain't only we love Larry now. <laughs> Not only is he brilliant and he's my friend, he was a Marine. OK, uh, and Simple in a slide, country that's, whose patriotism is, is going sideways. OK, this guy in a minute's notice is ready to like throw the, uh, the, the weapon over his shoulder and go over and kick somebody's ass. That's why I try to stay on his good side. I pick on Duran. I leave John. <laughs> and armed as, as a Canadian, yeah. I've been to Quantico a few times. So it uh, I understand that. Yeah, it's John. So, so it's an years. organism. It's a living organism. We talked about the thing I always make you laugh about. About Jesus would have been a great used car manager because mm. he washed the feet <laughs> of the disciples. And then, if there managers nurtured salespeople, they would nurture their customer. And you've been on every aspect of this business. What's your feeling with with this ridiculous ways managers treat salespeople rather than get them to run through a wall? And then, when he's done, I want to hear from Duran. Peter, yeah. Duran is my polar opposite. Where I'm insane and the walls start shaking, Duran is the most so soft-spoken guy you've ever heard, but he gets the job done. So, John, continue and let's hear from Duran. Yeah, well, I'll echo about Duran because Duran has the most attractive um you know, uh, attractive kind of uh, personality where he, you know, he sucks you in with just his excitement, enthusiasm, and his knowledge. So I can't wait either. But I'll finish because this is what I try to tell the the sales managers is simply this: it's their job to keep the blood flowing in the dealership. Their, their job is to heart pump that heart, and the more blood means the more activity. And you do that with transparency, honesty, getting your involved in the deals, rolling your sleeves up, helping with appraisals. Getting the salespeople excited about the acquisition channels you're going to use to make them more successful. Bringing the fresh inventory in, talking to the to your salespeople about how the inventory is selling, and get more of what they know selling well. And when you involve them in every area of the pro aspect of the process, then energy happens. Let me tell you what happens when you don't. Blood flow starts to slow. And what happens when blood flow slows? We get lethargic. We get sleepy. We get bored. We leave. Our paychecks get smaller. So if you take the latter approach. Instead of the former, I'm telling you, there's no way we're not going to sell more. And that's what our clients are doing is they're selling more because they're getting more involved. They're getting more inventory and they're getting their people excited about their the way they feel about the rest of this year. Whereas half the, the economy is scared to death. Our dealers aren't. They're excited and they can't wait to grow. Peter, John, John has a way of dealing with wholesale inventory that's so remarkable. Even guys like Bob Holland said, who's the, who's the number one wholesale on the planet Earth. Tips his hat to him. Um, I, John, I did a training manual. A guy called me up one time and said, I'm tired of these other bozos. Do you have a train the trainer manual? So I said, of course I do. And of course, Duran will laugh because I stayed up three nights and wrote a train the trainer's manual. And the first page <laughs> is three managers. And the caption is, we're heading to a, a sales meeting and the car has a flat tire. And one manager goes, it's only 70 miles. We'll be fine. And of course, that's ridiculous. But how many times the managers complain about oh, so good, Larry. without so fixing good. them, without fixing them or processes without fixing them. I, I see it all the time where they complain about a process. I'm like, well, let's get involved and fix it. Let's stop complaining about it. And it takes the longer thing. to bitch about things than it does to fix them. John and me are, are, are patriots, but we're going to quote Eldridge Cleaver, the Black Panther. He only said one thing that made sense to us. If you're not part <laughs> of the solution, you're part of the problem. If you can fix it, fix it. You can't shut the hell up. Get out of the way. Duran, did you it. talk to your did you talk to your wife? Is it okay for you to speak? Because <laughs> Duran's six foot nine and he's scared of his wife, like every other guy on earth, including now. Yeah, we, yeah I think she, I think I think <laughs> she's three foot nine too, right? Oh all my right, right Duran. You got all the good house. ideas. Share one I, for free. What's a great way to increase I, sales? I do. And so I'm going to keep it brief. And John and Larry both, thank you so much for your compliments. I, I echo that. I, every time I get to hear Larry speak and get to be in his presence, I enjoy it. Every time John speaks, I learn something new. And um, so what I want to give you is three quick three quick things. And I do have to hop on a, on a Zoom. I've got to get on a coaching call. So I'm going to carry these things over. So perfect time, Larry. But for sales, I'll give you three things that I would say. And I wrote them down to keep it brief. Number one, and Larry echoes this is questions lead to the best answers you know so please start with more questions i listen to thousands of phone calls a month ladies and gentlemen and we do not ask enough questions other than when can you come in or when do you want to buy ask the right questions that lead to a lot of yeses and a lot of great experiences the customers will do the selling for you if you ask enough questions number two 
make it memorable. So one thing I can tell you that you'll learn from Larry, every time you're around him or you have a conversation, you remember something that he <laughs> said. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage you to do the same. Make your experience memorable. What is one thing that you do, whether how you talk to him, while you presentate, demonstrate, whatever you do, have one thing that you know is gonna leave a lasting impression that your competition can't touch. Third thing, and it's what we're using right now outside of John, is video. So anybody that knows me, they know that the reason why I'm even still here and connected with so many people is okay. through my voice, through video. And since so much of what we do happens away from the dealership wall sometimes, fill that white space up with tons of pictures, tons of videos to connect that whole experience. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Hey, Dur Duran, can I, can I throw this in before you yeah. jump on your Zoom call? Two things. One, the fourth thing should be smile. If yes. you can just smile all the time yeah. and not be grumpy. The second thing is the reason you don't see John live, John no longer exists as a human being. <laughs> Tesla, Elon Musk himself grabbed him and sucked him into a human charged GPT. And nobody's ever seen the guy, but all we know is he shows up and brilliant things happen. Uh oh, there he is. <laughs> oh my I God. That's, crazy. That's a hologram. <laughs> it's a hologram. Oh well, Rhonda, Grand, it's, it's, thank it's, you. Uh, Peter, Grand, thank you so much. We're, we're going to be on every every Wednesday. You pop in anytime you want. Your input is welcome. And I told everybody up front what you do, what John does, and, and what Brooke does, and that we're getting ready to take over the planet as we know it. So we'll keep that good message going. And if any of you need it, know anybody that needs their dealership just kind of shaken up or put right, Peter's the guy. He's one of these guys, like the three of us, lays awake at night wondering if he did the job right. I don't want to keep you too much longer. Thank you so much. Please say hello to your wife for us and stay healthy, my good and great friend. Take care, Dren. Take care. Good night. Can I add something? It's not a car Please. story. It's not a car story, but it translates. Um, I'm uh, there's if there's one thing I really hate in this world, it's paperwork, and in this country. When you hit the Medicare age, they send you enough paperwork where they have killed five trees just for the paperwork they say they send Rhonda. And I'm how the hell would you know about Medicare? This You're is what they tell me. Years so, old and um, looking hot. Yeah. Hey John, I might be able to get a date out of this. <laughs> Don't tell my wife; she gets jealous. You be so, careful now. Right. Be very careful. So, so they send me all this paperwork, and I'm not I'm not reading this. So I call a broker, a, a Medicare broker. And I sit down with this young woman over coffee and she's my daughter's age, very personable. And somehow she intuited what I wanted to hear because we get to this point where she's presenting me with six, because once you get your Medicare, you get that, but then you got to pick, um, what is it called? Medicare advantage, an additional plan that you basically pay for that covers everything else. She gave me six options and I'm looking at her going, oh, I don't know. And finally, she goes, you know what? This is the one I had my mother sign up for. Sold. That's all she had to say. And I think that knowing who you're talking to and knowing how to get to them with that money line is critical. It's hard. It's something that takes maturity. I don't think you could have done it, Peter, as a brand new salesperson necessarily, but it's something that you pick up as you go along and you realize people have certain concerns. Rhonda, Rhonda here, it's, it's plain and simple. Everyone is going to agree with this. The people buy off of people that they like and they trust. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you can't build that report that is necessary to, to get to that level, then you have no shot on it. And it doesn't matter what the price is. Doesn't matter what the car is. Doesn't matter what you're selling. Doesn't matter anything. Doesn't matter location, convenience, nothing. It's people will walk away. And I can't tell you how many times I've walked out of a, a retail establishment, a restaurant, or or even a dealership because I've turned around and been so turned off by what I, I've seen or heard. It it just eliminates any benefits that I might receive moving forward. It's true. So it's still one of the number one reasons people buy a car because they like their salesperson. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If you're not likable, the rest of it doesn't matter. You could be brilliant. You could have every part of the car and the tech stuff memorized if they don't like it. John, you're going to laugh, but I say it all the time. 
The most important part of the steps is the meet and greet. Because if, if it doesn't go right, you're not getting to the other steps. I, and I love yep. to point to a woman because I'm the world's most politically incorrect trainer. And I love to say if our first date's bad, we're probably not talking about kinky sex or getting married. I'm getting kicked to the curb. If it doesn't start well, it's not going to end well. Um, you got to be friendly. You got to look at people when they get out of the car and go, wow. John looks like he's ready to say something. He unmuted. What's on your mind, my good and great Yeah, friend? no, no I, I, it's a transfer of your passion about, you know, what you do for a living and how you feel about the way you are enhancing people's lives. People can feel that if you just sell into sell and make some money, that's not going to work. I mean, you know that you're selling something of value that can change somebody's lives or enhance their lives. And that goes for cars or anything else. And so when people see you're excited about the experience, they're going to get excited about the experience. And I love um, the, you know, the story about transferring the personal experience. My mother bought this one or I bought this one. It brings trust and credibility instantly into the conversation. People want to buy from people. Everything that we've said here is so important. And they want to know that you are just excited about what you're selling as you're asking them to be about what they're buying. And the final thing is people want a personal, when we get, they want a personal experience. And if you can relate it to a personal experience, like I just heard, you can, you're going to win that relationship every time. And it'll be a long, loyal one too. John, I love to ask at every class, what do you say to the guy when you walk up to him and before you can open your mouth, he holds up his hand and says, don't even start with your sales pitch. I only have 10 minutes. I got to go watch my son or daughter play ball. The answer is, I can do it in 10 minutes. The answer is, what does your son play? Football, you might have the next time. Tennis, you might have the next Serena Williams. It's got to be about them, right? It's the, the Peter Drucker thing. If, if they're buying from you, what matters is what's important to them, not the other way around. Larry, two days ago, I, pr I put a post out there with a picture of a car dealership I started at in the 80s. It was a, a Jeep Eagle dealership. So if you remember Eagles and the Eagle Premiers and the Talons and all that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then wait, wait. And then when they when a they went out of business, it became AMC. And I don't know if you know it, but they were the first corporate company to embrace LSD. Because <laughs> anybody that could design the Matador and the Pacer... I mean, there were some ugly cars. The Javelin. The Ambassador. The Ambassador. The uh, Yo, John, have you, I know the Pontiac Aztec was not pretty, but yeah. hell, the Pacer looked like a big bath tub. <laughs> so so in, in this post I put out there, I said, I started in this business when there was no cell phones. There was no computers. We did locates on microfish. Most people don't even know what microfish is. They think they're guppies. But it's actually a little piece of plastic that that you would actually scan under a projection lens to find where cars were three weeks ago, because that's where they were three weeks ago, not today. You you did everything. You did all your financing using a calculator and long division. You did either you had no your filing cabinet and your Rolodex, which was a a, a business card file, was was your database. Yeah, that's where I started from. And I worked my ass off to get through this industry. And I became their car guy. And uh, unfortunately, that is that is a, a unwoke term today, a car guy. I was their car person. They called Excuse me. me. I don't mean to I don't mean to interrupt you, but you got the legendary John Ellis, Rhonda Winter, the best publicist anybody will ever meet. And Larry Feldman, do you think the three of us give a damn about woke? <laughs> nope. So I'm just being politically correct for your show. Uh, I'm not. Oh, I'm yeah, not that, that makes sense. So <laughs> having said this at the fire department, <laughs> having said that, I worked my ass off to be their car guy. Oh, hold on. Is he allowed to say ass, Rhonda? It's cable. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you're Canadian. It's past the children's Between bedtime. Truth. Yeah. yeah, between Trudeau and the fires and the mooses running wild, I guess he can get away. Hey, he looks a little hey. depressed, John. And it's but anyways, so. going through it, you worked your butt off. You had an attitude. You had a mindset. You you worked. You went to work to work. Joe Verde coined that phrase, or someone before that. No, it, no, no. It was it was it was Robert Pike. I know because I was researching for dealer many years ago. Robert Pike's the one that said, "Go to work to work." Yeah, and, and, stole that, from him. and that is the whole purpose thing. I don't care if you work six hours a day or your shift is four hours. I couldn't give a damn. 
Go there to work. Don't go there to read the internet. Don't go there to, to have coffee and stand at the reception's desk and say, hey, did you go out last night? It, it, I don't care. That that That's not what you're there for. You're just costing yourself money and me money. So hey, Peter, you're 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 a lot more straight, and I'm not, I'm being not being facetious. You're a lot more straight up and down than me because I'm mentally unstable. The way I explain it is, listen, guys, there's nobody that likes to goof off more than me. I'm a musician. I'm a ball player. I got a million interests. I'd much rather be shooting hoops and playing my guitar than hanging with you guys. But understand the concept. Look hey, how you're many five rewards four. How you can you shoot hoops? What's that? You're five four. How could you shoot hoops? Get elevator. your ass down here and you find out. <laughs> elevator <laughs> shoes. Go back to hockey with your skates hanging over your head. So listen to me. My thing is the coolest thing on earth in a working environment is looking at your iPhone or I'm old like you or you're watching go, yeah. well, it's time to go home. The day flew by. The worst thing is when you think Einstein's theory of time and relativity was off because the clock is moving backwards. If you're busy... The day flies by. You feel useful. You, you, like John said, you don't feel lethargic. The blood stops pumping. So my thing is, if you want to be unemployed and be a bum, go. Hey, but Larry, if you're Larry, going to go to work, work. To me, to me, NADA was last week, and that was in January. Yeah, but but that's but that's because you're a lonely guy. Peter, <laughs> let's face it. Well, hey, John, and he's my friend. Imagine what I say about my enemies. Well. You know what, Larry? I I really I like we share so many so many passions for this business. Wait a minute, John's John's going to make a very salient comment. Okay. No, I just I just said you sound like brothers. <laughs> well, but wait a minute, John, because you and me are like brothers. So That's what right. does that show? All right now, I'm throwing I'm throwing off the jokes now. What does that show? That shows that like-minded people that are glad they're above ground, that respect life, that respect each other, all feel a kindred spirit. Because we love that feeling of saying, I got in, I got it done. How great does that feel? Think how pathetic it is for these people younger than us that don't understand how satisfying it is to go to work, to accomplish something, John. So you're right. I do feel like, a, I feel like a brother with Duran. I even feel yeah. like a brother with, uh, with Brooke. She's kind of like a brother after this Bruce Jenner shit. Who can tell if you're a boy or girl? Anyway? Yeah. <laughs> She's great. I tell you, you're so right. And, uh, you know, I've got children uh, ages 30 to 19 and, you know, um, th they've got a good work ethic. And I think that's besides being a good human, that's the only other thing I could pray for. Right. And I see so much of it today where these kids making a hundred grand a year complain about going to work. You know, it's like, it's not the money. It's it's a commitment to something higher than self, and we, they weren't taught younger that the world does not revolve around them. And work has a has a, uh, and, and, you know, has a uh, direct effect on the world around them. And doing a good job and being proud of the job you do not only makes you feel like a, a valuable person to society, but it enhances society. And I'm afraid we're losing some of that, Larry. And that's what scares me the most is we've got to get back to showing our folks that hard work, yep. whether it's with your mind or your hands, yep. can, is the most valuable thing that you can do for yourself. Mar Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis. And uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of young people don't understand why he was there. He went there to settle this, help the sanitation workers who were on strike. Remember, they mm -hmm. held up signs that said, I am a man. Mm -hmm. And he. He talked from the Bible, Ecclesiastes, whatever thy hand shall find, do it with all they might. Yes. He said, if you're going to be a sanitation worker, be the best sanitation worker you can be. Whatever, I, John, you'd love it. I have a slide that says there is no such thing as an ex-Marine. Marines are Marines till they die and they'll wear Amen, those brother. colors in heaven. When you yep. look at things and say, I want to do my best, I want to give it every, Rhonda, Rhonda came to work with me, for me, however, maybe I work for her. And she came to see me, and we got into this dealership that had the smallest training room of all time. And what we have, Rhonda, about 20 people. It was and she put her, she's such a compassion. She put her arm and said, I'm so sorry, this room's. I said, it's great. We'll be sweating on each other. We'll be jumping up and down. The owner came in and hugged me. That's the clip you see sometimes. It goes, this guy's yeah. the best. Look at the energy in this place. Every yeah. negative is a positive. Everything is an opportunity. And when you look at things, okay, as challenges rather than hurdles or barriers, it's great. All it does is make us better and stronger. 
I, I mean, you've been through some stuff, John Ellis. So is Peter. R- R- Rondo, young and good looking as she is, she's a widow. Okay. Um, mm. th- we've all been through shit. Yeah. So the idea is to say, I'm going to get past this. My boy Winston Churchill said it. When you're going through hell, keep going. That's a bad place to stop. Go ahead, John. You look like you got another <laughs> comment. And boy, are we glad no. you joined us tonight. No, I love it. And you're so full of great quotes and history references. I love it. But it boils down to just No, no, no. Thing. Don't don't say that because Rondo edit down to just saying I'm full of it. <laughs> boy, <laughs> you are that too. Yeah. But there's value. And and I can tell you, Larry, uh, you know, um, it, you know, our age is wisdom. We get that. Uh, we learn a lot from watching others. Experience teaches us a lot, but hard knocks teach us the most. And I got to tell you, you know, adversity is where you find the true self. A guy told me one time when I was young, I was uh, working at a golf club restaurant in college, and he said uh, something went wrong. And I went in to apologize. I think maybe we made, messed up some food or something. And he, and he said, uh, look, I want to see how you react now. You, you've been a great employee and a great worker, but now that there's adversity, that's when your true character is going to show. How would how would I have forged through that? And in, 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 the Marine Corps is another great example, right? I mean, it was the worst experience of my life and the best experience of my life, the most terrifying and the most exciting and rewarding. Right. And so, and then of course I am a combat Marine. So I spent some time in Bush's first war and that was very scary. Right. And so thinking through all that, uh, it, who I am today would not be who I am without that. And I'm so Don, I have thankful to correct for those you, hard you, times. You said it was the scariest thing in your life. You told me the scariest thing in your life was when you invited me to speak to your church group. That was pretty <laughs> tough too. That was tough too. But so, <laughs> man, I so could, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on what John just said and and read something that I I, I wrote to a, a young a young lady in this business um, that was talking about obstacles and i said if we treat obstacles as opportunities we will flourish with growth as our strength from these challenges becomes our driver towards success we need to focus on making this the future not just encountering we Mm. can drive to our own future we just need to have that mindset that nothing that we're doing is really like you you call it hell you're going through hell no you're not you have no idea what hell is john you were in combat that is as close to hell as you're gonna get like no one no one's shooting at you in a car dealership at least not most dealerships (laughs) you didn't work in trent new jersey yeah you need to go to memphis (laughs) i i don't stop in trent new jersey i've crossed that bridge many a time and just kept going yeah, I love it. Yeah, look, the point is, I think you're making it well, is you've we've got to stick to it, right? We can't give up. We can't quit. And that's the thing the Marine Corps taught me early in life. And I needed it. I didn't have it before then because life was rough. Um, but the Marine Corps taught me to improvise, overcome, adapt, and just, you know, muscle through it because you will come out on the other side. And so, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest lesson I learned is believe in myself and believe I can get through it. And that's what helped me to get through it. So that's a good point you make there. Sales is a sales is a transference of not, uh, knowledge and passion, mm, and yep. if you can do that, you will encounter success every single time. Okay, oh, yeah. listen, I got three of my favorite people on the line. I've been carrying this thing in my wallet forever. Okay, it's it's a quote from the Hasidic texts from rabbis, and he said, "You're going to love this." Um. He said, there are three things that you, concepts that can help you get through life. The first is that in the service of God, one can learn three things from a child and seven from a thief. From a child, you can learn to always be happy, never to sit idle and to cry for everything you want. From a thief, you should learn to work at night. If you don't get what you want one night, to try again the next night, to love one's coworkers just as thieves love each other, to be willing to risk one's life even for a little thing, not to attach too much value to things, even though you've risked your life for them, just as a thief will resell a stolen article for a fraction of its real value, to withstand all, I love this one, John, to withstand all kinds of beatings and tortures, but to remain what you are and to believe that your work is worthwhile and not be willing to change it. It, He keeps rolling. He says, Another Hasidic rabbi once said that you can learn something from everything. 
even from a train, a telephone, and a telegram. From a train, he said, you can learn that in one second, you can miss everything. From a telephone, you can learn that what you say over here can be heard over there. And last but not least, from a telegram that all words are counted and charged. I thought you guys would get a kick out of that. I always try to understand and live by those principles. Well, you, I love you're, it. Not, you're, you're not, those, those words are as true today as they were said 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 30 years ago. They, well, these were, a couple, these were a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's without without doubt when you talk the truth you can that has no time limit never so when you're when you're pushing someone out of dealership and when i say pushing when you're motivating that person when you're giving them the opportunity to succeed by through your experience it's not it it's not by beating on them it's by motivating them and giving them the recognition of absorbing it and and you is it we we started off the call with the rah-rah meetings that that are actually not rah-rah meetings they're beat down meetings and saying okay now now that i've told you you guys are 10 cars behind your unit your volume totals for the month and we're down on on gross profit and there are and we're not calling people back and we're not doing this and we're not doing that but go out and do it. it it just doesn't work if you turn around and say hey guys you know what we're almost there all we have to do is do this we don't don't take what we're missing take take that little step take that we're, we're down by 10 calls there's 10 of you that's one call each that's all you have to do can we do that today can we get that recognition it it's it's the presentation of the management. It's the leadership, and 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 I'm I'm sure John has read the book uh, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Wilnick, and it's it's how you present it and who takes accountability for it. I've always said the problem in a dealership is not that of the sales staff, it's of the stakeholders. And if if you look at it in that perspective, everything trickles down to the bottom. You set it up from the top. You don't set it up from the bottom. Unfortunately, when you're building the dealership, you build it from the bottom. Well, my, my favorite president, and it made me nauseous when Biden said it because he was a liar. My favorite president was Harry Truman, who said the buck stops with me. He wasn't afraid to take the blame. He wasn't afraid to get criticized. John, you want to hear something monumental? How great was this man? He left the presidency. He was broke. He didn't have a lot of money. Um, and they offered him a ton of endorsements. And he said, I would never do anything to cheapen the presidency. Never. Uh, mm. I, I, he, he came out with this plan to help the people in Europe because we'd obviously Europe had been devastated. And he said, if it's my name is on it, they'll never pass the damn thing. So he put it under George Marshall, who was the most popular and respected general. That's how it was, yeah. became known. Marshall the Marshall plan. plan. And last but not least, to keep Rhonda happy, Truman said, behind every successful man, there's a proud a woman. Who, yeah. Other man. Yeah. <laughs> a woman who made it necessary. I love it. No yeah. question about it. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I love I, the, I've oh, used, oh. Go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say, I love the reference you made to leadership because I think we forget that. I mean, our job as leaders is to cultivate and fertilize the ground that our people uh, walk on. And so, that that starts with a few things taking responsibility for you know things that aren't going well and then putting plans together to execute so that they we can change the course of the ship not just saying go do more go get better and, and that's not going to work the quote you want to use john is the late great joe paterno who said when we do things wrong it's my fault when we do things right it, the team accomplished it that's right that's exactly, exactly. right and look People feel empowered and they feel safe because let me tell you, if all you're doing is beating down your people, they're going to find a place where they feel empowered and they're safe to be creative. They're safe to make a mistake and they're safe to think outside the box. But guess what they're going to be? They're going to be your top performers if you give them room to make some mistakes, but also grow. Mistakes are only life's learning experiences. Mm -hmm. That's I, I have to, and you'll like this, John. I had a young kid in class today. He's going to be a winner. And I said, 
Um, I don't, I'm not asking your age. I saw it on your license. I know you're young. Um, if I asked you, do you have any really good friends? I would hold up my hand before you answered and said, wait a minute, were you ever in trouble? And if you came, said to me, no, my dad's very strict. I would be, I'm more afraid of him than I am of the police or anything else. I'd never been in trouble. Then I'd say that I have really bad news for you. You don't know who your friends are because you never mm -hmm. know who's really on your side till you get jammed up. And then within 48 hours, you know exactly who's really your friend and who's really on your side. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I, one thing I'd like to add here is uh, when we look at the young salespeople of today, they want to start on the 100th floor of the sky mm -hmm. They don't mm -hmm. understand that a foundation to anything starts at the bottom and you work your way up. And unfortunately, on top of that, the people that are on the hundred floor of the skyscraper don't look down to the foundation anymore. And mm. they, they fail to recognize how, what it took to get there. And it's only a select few of these dealer groups that actually understand what it took, how, how it took to get there and what it's going to take for the people below them to rise up to where they are and give them that pathway. And, and when you see the success of great dealer groups, they have that pathway to success mapped out for every employee. You know, as a car porter, how many steps it's going to take and how long it's going to take to get to the service writer, to get to the service manager, to get to fixed stops manager, to get to director of uh, fixed stops, to get to a general manager's position, this, that. They know how long, how many years and what the income level is at a, every level. And that's- Peter, if you have the best navigation system in the world, you don't put in the coordinates, you'll never get where you're going. Yeah, if, it's like, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And it's-, and it's <laughs> I love that. And, yep. it, and it's it's unfortunate. If you're lost, you're just lost. And that that's the, the end of that quote, and any road will get you there. It's, well, it's, we're, we're sneaking up on eight o'clock. Sure. Um, John, we're, we're going to be doing this every every Wednesday at 7 p.m. You added tremendously to this discussion. Anytime you want to join in with us, um, me and you know I love having you around. Peter, what a pleasure it was. Uh, uh, Brian Maxwell's on this with me, but he, he got married, and, and man, I'm sure his schedule's you know all over the place, so Peter decided to jump in. But it was truly a pleasure having you and Duran on. And Rhonda, you know I'm always eternally grateful to you. John, she keeps me straight. That's like I don't know how duty, you know? I don't I don't know how I'm very talented. Rhonda, have, yeah, <laughs> very, very talented. I'm also I have a whip and a chain, you know, that kind and, of and she's got the button to the electric shock. underneath That's it. The chair. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, everybody stay healthy. Thank you so much for your contributions. It was great to see all three of you and obviously great to see our buddy Duran. Stay healthy. Look forward to seeing you and working with all of you. Have a yeah, great Yeah, great, night. Larry. So great, much. great show, buddy. Thank Good you, job, everybody, Pleasure for coming. We'll, we'll, we'll nice see you see next you. week. Yep. All right. Take care, everyone. Good night.